Welcome, everybody. This is a U.S. Great Sports Podcast. I'm Doug Berry, along with my very good friend, Father Richard Heilman. And tonight we've got Xavier Aral is back with us again, and especially during Holy Week. This is a fantastic time to have him. And we're going to be talking about the confusion and chaos going on in the world and in the church. What does this have to do with us now, and what can we do in these times? Of course, we want to bring prayer into the beginning of this. So, Father, we turn that to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Father. Amen. And of course, we always want to start off thanking everybody out there who supports the U.S. Grace First podcast. Your prayers, your help, your support, your comments, your financial contributions through the Patreon program, all are very powerful ways of helping us continue to get these messages out. Stories, conversations, topics, information that will really benefit and help everybody, especially right now with so much confusion in the church, so much going on in the world. A lot of people are struggling with discouragement, with hope. Your support is big, and so keep us in your prayers, please. And for those of you who support us through the Patreon program, thank you so much. If anybody's interested, click the link in the description below. So please join the team. Let's get that. Let's get that message out as far and wide as we possibly can. Um, You know, Father, it is Holy Week, and I know we wanted to start off. You wanted to give a little, a little encouragement for everybody to kind of put things in perspective. As this is being released on Wednesday of Holy Week. Yeah. So you can see in our title. I mean, there's confusion and chaos out there. I mean, a lot of people are really feeling what's going on. Why? Because evil seems to be advancing so fast uh, during this time. And if you look at Holy Week, and we're actually recording on Monday of Holy Week, which would have been the Feast of the Annunciation, but it was moved because the church does that. If it's on Holy Week, they move it off so they can be celebrated on its own. So it's moved off of Holy Week and the octave of Easter to April 8th. And we just find it interesting. I don't know what God's doing, but that happens to be when we're going to have a solar eclipse during that time. As we're recording right now, uh, I was just reading earlier today that we're we're in the midst of a a geomagnetic storm from heaven. Uh, It's actually the the, we're in the midst of a a full moon. I think it's called the worm moon at this time. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I don't know what any of this means, but uh, but I think there's a sense out there that. You know, again, evil is advancing. And look at Holy Week. Look at what it was. I mean, uh, Jesus Christ, you know, he he's at one point, things are going well, and they're having their supper together. And all of a sudden, it just turns. And it, and it looks like all is lost, doesn't it? Mm. He gets arrested. He hangs on a cross. He dies. He's put in a tomb. And you think, it's over. And then he's resurrected. This is the hope that we need to hold in our hearts, no matter how tough it gets. uh, People like to use the term, God wins in the end, but that doesn't mean that we sit idle and do nothing. You know, we have to, first of all, we have to pray, and we have to call upon that great gift we've been given, the powerful intercession of the Mother of God, Mary, during this time. We're in the midst of a nine-month novena with uh, the most beautiful cardinal I've ever known, you know, Cardinal Burke. Uh, and, and so there's just a lot going on right now. But again, look what Holy Week is. Look what it is. It seemed all was lost, but Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, God does win in the end. He always does. But how does he get us there? How does he get us to rise? And I think that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, what, 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 what do we feel God is showing us at this point in history? Uh, and, and, and again, 2024, this is a point in history where we're facing just a lot of struggles. We're facing a a lot of um, uh, the, uh, I'll call it the intrusion of evil in our time. And, and, And what are we seeing too? We're seeing all those that were surrounded Jesus abandon him. You know, one was left, John. And then it was Mary and, and uh, Mary Magdalene usually pictured at the foot of the cross, but all the other first bishops, uh, were gone in silent self-protection, uh, but they came back. They came back, right? 
and 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 they became even stronger because of what they went through. Peter denied him three times. Our first pope denied him three times, um, and he said he never would do that, and yet he did when push came to shove. So here we are, here we are in this moment. Uh, it's filled with chaos. It's filled with confusion, but we can't give up. We got to keep hope, and that's what I hope everyone brings into this Holy Week. You know that God is more powerful than the devil, okay? And God will win in the end, but he's asking us to participate in his plan for salvation. So that's all, that's all I have just to open up right now, Doug. Yeah, and and, it, and you're right. It is, I mean, the greatest sin ever committed by man, I think the saints refer to it as deicide, you know, the murder of God, yeah. that, you know, our Lord would suffer like he did. But then in that darkest moment, the greatest gift redemption is given to the world. Uh, Xavier, you know, you and I were on the phone earlier today talking about one of the big concerns you have is um, the, you know, people leaving the faith. And yeah. I think some of that can happen when one starts to misunderstand the mysteries and why we don't get answers to some of these mysteries and the confusion in the world and the chaos in the world and in the church even. And yet we have been warned by many, many great apparitions in the past. And you worked um, under a priest, studied under a priest, Father Rene, and but you studied under him, and he was instrumental in the approval process of many very significant uh, apparitions and messages and miracles that happened, you know, in different ways in the world. Can you give us a little background about that? Yes, um, I was. I worked for about eight years with um, the Reverend Father Rene Laurentin before they made him a, a monsignor. And uh, the Americans used to call him the Marian Jacques Cousteau. It even mm. looked like him, remarkably enough. Always dressing in black with a white collar, of, uh, which was a sweater pullover. And he looked and talked uh, like uh, Commandant Jacques Cousteau, and he was totally devoted to the Virgin Mary since uh, the end of World War II, since he became a priest. And he was instrumental uh, on the uh, recognition process of the renowned and approved apparition site of San Nicolas in Argentina, of Betania. He was, uh, he and his scientific and theological team traveled across the world to meet with the local visionaries and made a report to the archbishops. And he was pivotal in that particular apparition site as well. The same with Kibero in Rwanda in the 1980s. He was uh, the reason why the local archbishop recognized uh, the uh, local apparition in Kibero as being worthy of belief. Soufanié in Syria, and of course, he is also renowned for having written a library of books on the uh, Bernadette Soubirou from Lourdes, Sainte Catherine Labouret from the Rue du Bac, where the miraculous medal comes from, and he is uh, remarkably well known for uh, having written the very first book on the secret of La Salette, which uh, were found uh, by sheer accident in 1999 by his collaborator, Father um, Courtville. No. So I had the privilege of working with him for eight years mm -hmm. on a particular uh, apparition case. And I went to Paris uh, with him. We, we became very good friends. And uh, it was a tremendous privilege. I learned immensely with him. And he was very patient with me. I was a very young man at the time. But it was uh, one of the greatest experiences of my life, I think. Wow. And, you know, and I know you've written a book, Revelations, and we'll get it up here on the screen. Let everybody have a chance to look at that for those. And you've been on our podcast several times. So for those people who have not seen you already, um, and I know many have, many are very familiar with you and you've been on many other podcasts. You've been really making the rounds, explaining what's going on with different things in the world right now. Um, and, and, and it's just a real honor to have you back on. So I want to encourage everybody to check the link in the description below, going out and get this great book, uh, Revelations. And you've studied extensively. This is one incredibly detailed book. Uh, and what I've always appreciated about you, Xavier, is that you bring the information and you've researched it. And when we were talking on the phone earlier, you you were you expressed some very serious concern about about things right now. Yes, um, I had a conversation the day before yesterday with John Henry Weston, who came to Florida for a few days with his wife. We spoke for a few a couple of a few hours about this same subject of conversation. And uh, indeed, if Father Laurentin were alive, uh, I mean, I still remember him before anything telling me 
you know, Xavier, I wonder if uh, I will live enough, long enough to see the times of prophecies, the prof times of prophecies of, of old. Uh, because right now we are only living in the times of admonitions. Father Laurentin or Laurentin uh, died in 2017. And I... I think he is better off and not having lived what we are beginning only now to live. Uh, I spoke two days ago as well with some of his ex-collaborators in France now who are old priests, two particular Catholic priests who wear his uh, right arms to discuss that which I discussed with you a few moments ago before the show and with uh, John Henry Weston two days ago. No? And they, are situ they, they want to remain anonymous. They, they do not want to have any issues with the local Archbishop of, uh, of Paris. So I will respect them. But um, the fact of the matter is they said that, and that's something that I, as I told you on the telephone, I totally agree with them. One of the greatest um, conclusions we can get from fiducia supplicants right. and uh, all the, the books that have been revealed as having been written by Cardinal Fernandez which uh, the great majority of uh, of priests today, in, even in France, consider nothing more but a collection of obscenities. No? Uh, the work of Father James, uh, by blessing openly, and what's more alarmingly, publicly, um, couples that are not in good standings with the church. The list could go on and on. According to these two collaborators of Father Laurentin, it appears that the devil, being ever so astute, is trying to inspire the faithful to feel more and more uh, scandalized. Scandalized by what some call here infamy, others uh, errors of judgment, however you call it. Scandal is being inspired. For one purpose is to inspire the faithful uh, to leave a church which they might think uh, not to be one any longer. Of course, I do not agree with that idea. I do believe that it is a trap that the devil is setting in front of us for us to leave the ship, the vessel which the Catholic Church is, as described by Don Bosco. We must remain on board. We must keep a cool head. And if we feel scandalized, it is an opportunity to make an exercise to self-control ourselves, to keep a cold head, and most of all, to pray, and yes, even for those whom we think, or we might think, might have fallen victim to error, who might have fallen victim even to, and God forgive me, I'm not pointing fingers to anyone, but who might have fallen victim to apostasy, maybe even heresy. Now, this uh, fiducious, uh, uh, this Some latest document that has just been released by the by the church is nothing short, but a new um, understanding, a new teachings of what the Catholic Church, the deposit of the faith, has been instructed the faithful to do, not to condemn no? uh, the homosexuals, so fiducious supplicants, not at all. For indeed, if a person feels those particular emotions, we have to pray for them. He has to pray for himself. No? It's a cross to bear. The real the real sin is to fall to the temptation and to violate the, not only the laws of nature, but most of all, the laws of God. To bless such a thing, to bless a couple that come to a priest and ask them for blessing, now, is um, in a new interpretation of the teachings of Christ. A priest, very much like at confession, cannot, if a person comes to confession and say, Father, bless me for I have sinned, for I intend to sin again. And after you give me absolution, I will continue to sin. And I've made myself a commitment to another person to sin with him. A priest will not give absolution to a person who is not repentant. Therefore, to do with suppli uh, fiducious supplicants for a couple that is homosexual, that is openly violating the laws of God and nature, and intends fully to continue doing so and shows no repentance, it's equivalent as blessing sin. All this of course, leads to confusion because it is supported by the Vatican through the head of the congregation of the, doctrine, of the doctrine of the faith, nothing less, and supported as well by the 
pontiff by the vicar of Christ, although he doesn't want to be called vicar of Christ, either on the yearbook or in person. Mm -hmm. All these things, one after the other, after the other, leads to a paradox which no one's, I'm afraid, I regret to say, understands. So what are we to do? No. According to prophecies, none of this is new. All mm. this has been forewarned again and again, beginning with La Salette in September of 1846, followed shortly thereafter by Marie Julie Jahini in the 1860s, 1870s, all the way to the 1940s. This has also been foretold in the third secret or should I say, in the second half of the third secret of Fatima, which I have in my book, Revelations. And lastly, in the famous uh, public message of Akita, again formally approved by the local bishop, uh, His Excellency Ito, and by the prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in 1980, who at the time was His Eminence, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger future Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. So, again, I do believe, very much like Father Laurentin's collaborators in Paris, this is a trap for us, first of all, to lose our faith in the Church, which will never fall to the fires of hell, as per the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to fall into a trap of disillusionment, uh, of discouragement, of scandal, we cannot leave the Catholic Church. Christ did not make a mistake. Christ was able to foresee the future. And Christ did indeed uh, bestow his church upon Peter, uh, knowing fully well that not just now, but in the course of our history, the Catholic Church would have some anti-popes, mm. some um, heretic uh, priests, cardinals, bishop. The great miracle of the Catholic Church is that a perfect infallible doctrine of the faith has survived over 20 centuries through imperfect man. Mm. Mm. Savior uh, and Doug and our listeners, I just believe right now at this moment in history, uh, the mercy of God, divine mercy, especially the divine mercy devotion is so important right now. God is, is extending his mercy and, and, begging us, compelling us to come into his arms and receive that mercy. You know, but uh, say, having said that, I opened up one of my homilies in recent days, and I, I started out this way. I said, don't condemn, don't condone. And I think what, what's happening in our time is the word mercy is being abused to say, we're not condemning you. And we are condoning your sin because of the mercy of God. And that's not what we're saying. We want people to live healthy, happy lives. And by healthy, I mean spiritual, which extends then to psychological, which oftentimes extends to physical, but, but healthy, full of joy, full of a sense of right and wrong. You know, I was, I, I was saying in what, one of my sermons last week, I said, and this is people who are my age and older can can recall this, but when I was a kid, you guys remember pulling into the driveway of your house and leaving the keys in the ignition? You know, I, we just, everybody had a strong moral compass at that time. Everybody knew, and, and why? And, and I believe because in this present age, churches are closing, people are fleeing the church, in that age, they were filled to the brim, and there was many. There were, you know, they were down the street from each other. Uh, it, why? Because they were well connected to truth, to God's will, to God's love, to God's mercy. They were well connected to that. And when you're well connected like that, then knowing right from wrong is comes naturally or supernaturally for sure. But but uh, you obviously don't do what offends God, and you also obviously do what pleases God. And that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Uh, that's when that snake dangling from that tree, as pictures portray, you know, and convincing, 
you know, the, the sin of Adam. And what is the sin of Adam? You know, he, it, well, here's here's what he, he uh, his narrative, right? How he indoctrinated Adam and Eve. He said, your eyes will be open. Okay, what's that like? Woke, right? Your eyes will be open. You will become like God, small g's. You will become like God yourself. And you, and I'll add my part because this is my interpretation of it, you will have your own idea of good and evil right now. You know, so and that's what's happening right under our nose, right under our nose right now. But here's where I'm going with this, Savior, and I'd like to get your take on it, is it's happening because we're letting it happen. We're not doing anything about it. We're not standing up for the truth. I always say there's two things that Satan despises, truth and transcendence. And why transcendence? Because transcendence gets us well-connected, gets us in that place where you can now have, if everybody's well-connected all around you, you can now have a culture where you can leave your keys in the car when you go home. You know, we're nowhere near that right now. Why? Because we're disconnected, right? And so, Xavier, you know, how did we get here? We, I, 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 this is what I'm saying is that is that I believe the spiritual leaders let us down. You know, they they didn't. First of all, they didn't speak quickly and clearly. No, no, no. That's a lie you're hearing. That's not the new normal. You know, that's not what we're supposed to do. Um, no, marriage isn't for anything. You know, you can't, can't kill babies. There's some of that out there, but it's like token little tiny things. Um, who is shouting it from the rooftops? You know, or or like that parent that sees their toddler run, run out into busy traffic. No, no, you say to that child, you can't go out into that busy traffic. You know, where is that anymore? And I don't know. I I, I just feel like yes, you can. You, uh, there's a lot of factors. Our comforts, you know. And our pleasures, and and now we're in the internet age and the cell phones, sure. But now in this age where evil feels like it's it's their time, they're just they're just walking in and saying, "Okay, sit down, be quiet. We got this." You deplorables who actually believe in God, no, we got this, and this is this is what we believe from now on. We're deciding what's good and evil, right and wrong. We're the new gods in charge because we're woke. Our eyes are open. Xavier, can you comment on that? Yes. I tell you this, Father, and I'm being very sincere. In these times of difficulty where the church is living through a civil war, and I think we all agree. Yes. Without relieving a civil war. And that war. goes to Akita, cardinal against cardinal, bishop against bishop, but go ahead. Right. Quite so. But it warms my heart sincerely to see priests like you to see priests like uh, those um, uh, men in back in France, like Bishop Strickland, like men like Doug, like uh, men like um, John Henry Weston, so many Strickland others. Bishop Strickland was like that parent with that child going on to traffic. No! And he gets canceled exactly. because of that. And anybody's getting canceled for doing But you that. know, in every war, there, is bat there are battles. And men like you, Father, because it is not easy. Believe me, I'm lucid. I know you're exposing yourself. Because you lived with uh, one particular compass, your conscience and your faith. Men like you, men of the church that expose themselves to criticism, like Doug, like others, that is the faith, that is the hope that the faithful are looking up to. You've been sent, I believe, sincerely, without any false pretense or attitude. You have been sent by the Holy Spirit for you to, to touch the souls, the hearts of so many. And I see it in your other shows. There, you have an accent, and it is not to throw flowers in your direction, gentlemen. It is sincere. You have an accent of complete sincerity while being indifferent of the consequences to your own persons. That is a print of God on your work. The same thing I told to, to uh, John Henry two days ago. But it is true that in every war there is conflict, and it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. And as far as whether the Virgin Mary is concerned. I wondered for many, many years, I even had this conversation with Father Laurentin years ago before he passed away. Why is God sending Father and Doug? The Virgin Mary again and again and again and again in the four corners of the world. 
Father Lord answered me, because we, the priest, have fallen, have fallen, have failed to perform the mission that God the Father, through his Son, has bestowed upon us by teaching the gospel. The Virgin Mary has only come to say what she said in uh, Cana, do everything my son tells you, period. Everything that we yep. need to, for salvation was written the last by John, St. John the, the Apostles. Everything is in revelations, in the revelation of the Gospels. We don't need anything else. We don't need anything else. The apparitions of the Virgin Mary are simply an admonition. As you said, is the voice of God saying, no, change direction now before it's too late. And truly, and I'm not trying to, and I know I won't because you're not this, this kind of man, but your presence, your word, the fact that you're there to guide people who are falling uh, into complete confusion, because this is confusion. It's a contradiction for a vicar of Christ who doesn't want to be called a vicar of Christ, to be teaching, to be permitting so many errors of the faith to be proclaimed publicly while getting off from their positions, men of the caliber of His Excellency, Bishop Strickland, who was nothing else but exemplary in yeah. his faith and in his work. Nobody can tell me otherwise. Nobody is capable of pointing fingers at His Excellency, Bishop Strickland, who was only guilty of one thing, following the faith, the Roman Catholic and Apostolic faith. Now, what these other men in power back in Rome are doing are presenting a new interpretation of what we as Catholics have been taught since we are the age of reason. And that neither is subject to interpretation. You cannot justify the unjustifiable. It does not mean two arms. No. The only arm I know, the only weapon I know, is this one after the Holy Sacrament of the altar and after the sacraments like confession and the Holy Scriptures and the Gospels and Catechism. You mentioned earlier, Father, that we are supposed to going through the same sort of passion that our Lord uh, went through. You couldn't have been more right. No, I believe that, and even it is in Catechism that it is stated so, we have to go through via crucis. And when I say we, the Catholic Church, because Rome is not all of the Catholic Church. It's nothing less, but nothing more rather than its uh, um, hierarchy. But you, Father, Doug, our family, all those who are watching us, that's the Roman Catholic Church. And we are supposed to follow our Lord through the crosses. And before there is a res resurrection, we have to go through crucifixion. We have to be buried and, th and to, we have to be thought as being gone and forgotten. But only to, like our Lord, rise on the third day and scream victory, triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. At least it is what I believe. Xavier, I'm curious if you could break down. Um, you've studied so much, and your book is so extensive regarding the Marian apparitions and visionaries, the church-approved messages. Father mentioned at the beginning, you know, we talked beforehand that, you know, we've got this um, these signs in the heavens that we, we hear about. The eclipse, what does it mean? And I'm not expecting you to give us the absolute answer on some of this stuff. But God works in such mysterious ways, and some of those ways are through these approved messages and visionaries and, and mystics and such. How can you, or are you able to kind of pull from what you've studied and what you know and apply it maybe to what we see happening now, both in the church and in the world? And there seem to be so many things that, whether it's coincidental or not, are pointing towards what we get this sense of something around the corner something we're on the doorstep of the precipice of something is that on april 8th is it 40 days after which happens to be the eve of pentecost you know going back to jonah preaching to nineveh saying you've got 40 days or you're going to be destroyed and there was an eclipse at the, roughly the time that he was preaching can you pull some of this together for the audience and for us with regards to again what you've studied what you know what we know is approved the messages, the warnings, what we see happening in the church and in the world. Big yes. picture. Big picture. Just, just help us all understand it so we can walk away unconfused. <laughs> I fully, fully understand. I can tell you uh, two things in regards to immediate future 
and the signs of the time. No? Yeah. Uh, and then, if you like, I can read you from approved apparition sites what has been foretold and what we can expect. Sure. But I am in direct communication, as most of your viewers know, with Reverend Father Michel Rodrigue. No? And also, I'm a very good friend with Glenn Hudson. You, I think you had him on your show once or twice, I believe. Glenn Hudson is an American gentleman, exemplary man, extraordinary person. As you Americans say, he doesn't have an evil bone in his body. He is the appointed person whom the uh, visionary of Garabandal, Conchita Gonzalez, no? an, um, a visionary from an, a little village from northern Spain that has not been condemned. It is uh, the investigation is still pending, and that in itself says a lot. I know for a fact that the local bishop is very much sympathetic, sympathetic to the mission of Garabandal. And I will tell you a secret before all your viewers, which neither you or Father Richelman will reveal. So this is a secret between us. Okay. And the secret is this: Father Rene Laurentine, who was the foremost expert in Marian apparition sites in his time was agnostic about Garabandal. No. Uh, the man could have been not my father. He could have been my grandfather. We got along so well because um, the, the milieu in social um, station in France, his, was very similar to that of my family. He fought during World War II. My uncles joined General Charles de Gaulle in London after Marshal Pétain signed the armistice with Adolf Hitler. So we had a great connection about the past, about France, about our faith. So we discussed about Garabandal. Father Laurentine did not understand uh, Garabandal because it was so different from the other apparition sites. And you'll understand where I'm going with all this. The children were walking backwards. Uh, the apparitions lasted for many, many years. The messages were by the thousands, although the public ones were only about a score. Uh, and I told him only once I did not want to continue a polemic with him because out of sheer respect now for the man, he was my elder and he was an expert. I was a young man, full of ideas, but <laughs> hardly in the same caliber as he was. But for me, what was the cornerstone which gave credibility to Garabandal was the formal approval and testimony, verbal and in writing, made by Saint Padre Pio, to the children of Garabandal. A copy of her, the first letter I have in my book, the photo, along with the, English, the Italian writing and the English translation, saying and admitting that the version appeared to him, confirming that Garabandal was right. Now I'm going to my point. When the version, when rather, when the version may uh, appear to uh, Conchita Gonzalez, she told her that in the end of times, after the passing away or after the fourth Pope from that time, which was Benedict XVI. In other words, after Benedict XVI, the events will follow one another at a quick pace. And one of the principal ones will be um, the upcoming um, illumination of conscience, also known as the warning, or as Father Michel Rodrigue calls it, the new Pentecost, a universal one. No? So according to that particular source, uh, Conchita Gonzalez will warn the world a few days before the event takes place through an appointed representative who will have four tasks to publicize through every means of uh, and every media uh, what is to come, beginning with the Pentecost. This person is Glenn Hudson. So he do keep an eye with Glenn Hudson and with his future communiques. So that is the first half to my answer to your question, uh, Doug. The second half, I spoke as you, um, as your immense majority of viewers know, with uh, Reverend Father Michel Rodrigue, who went through a controversy of sort, a controversy which was cleared, and which he explained himself, and which I can give confirmation since I spoken to the Archdiocese of Amos in Quebec, who confirmed to me that Father Michel Rodrigue is indeed in good standing and not at all uh, condemned in any way, shape, or form by his local archbishop, with whom he is friends. They both went to the semin uh, seminary together, and they call each, each other, they speak to each other like uh, like brothers. 
although they, he simply does not agree or does not believe in all these revelations, although he's intrigued. I heard this from a chancellor of his. Father Michel Rodrigue told me as of late that uh, the events that are to come, uh, beginning with um, this illumination of conscience, quote-unquote what he calls the new universal Pentecost, is imminent. And you'll remember, I'm sure, the message that he received on December the 31st, which I think uh, we echoed on your channel uh, some time ago. No? So that is my answer to your question. Mm -hmm. I hope it answers it properly. Can you uh, help me understand, uh, Xavier, because a couple of things happened to me recently. One was just recently, I was watching an interview with John Henry Weston and Ted Flynn. And Ted Flynn okay. has written extensively on Garabandal. And of yes. course, then he got into the Illumination Conscience. And where he went, and it was kind of, I felt it was like a confirmation because only like in the last couple of weeks, I came to a, a personal revelation. And it's this, that I tell the story that uh, my vocation to the priesthood came in one day. The, the day before, all the days prior, are you kidding me? I'm not going to be a priest. And in one day, I got a, a by the day's end, my my parents and I were contacting the vocation director, and I love my priesthood. I don't regret one second of it, uh, but it came in one day. And I've realized, and I, I'd like your opinion on this. You know what happened on that day? I had the illumination of conscience. I I had what is is experience where you see yourself as God sees you have regret for things you did in the past. You have, you have a sense of what God is. And here's the other thing I'll say about that too, because that's what um, actually Ted Flynn was talking about. He said, this has happened to people. They've had the illumination conscious. What I took as, as kind of a, a uh, 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 what's the word? I just said it earlier, but uh, it, it reinforced what I was, what I was thinking about, was that what I had on my 23rd birthday? Which, by the way, it's a fun little fact I like to tell. Uh, my 23rd birthday was June 24th, 1981, which was the first day that Our Lady started appearing in Medjugorje, and I had no idea. Exactly. <laughs> I found out that later. But uh, but I had an illumination of conscience, and I don't know. I, I don't know what God's going to do, but it could, you could see that something might happen. See, because prior to that, I thought illumination of conscience... Uh, because it sounds so spiritual and everything. Are we going to levitate and are we going to be in a cloud? And what's going to, what is the illumination of conscience? How about everybody has an experience like what I had? And here's the other thing I'll say about that. Like what I've been trying to express all along is the effect the mass should have on every soul that goes there. I started doing the mass as Pope Benedict asked us to do it which is, a, I call it a purified form of the Novus Ordo. It's what Vatican II actually asked us to do. And I witnessed hundreds for sure who would walk into that church. Maybe they've been away from church for, uh, for a long time, or maybe they've never been there. And they walk in and they go, and, and they literally have that experience of, <laughs> I get who I am. I'm a child of God. I uh, Oh boy, look what I did. Okay, I asked for God's mercy. I'm ready to do this now with God. Do you see what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, they're 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 enlightened, okay? But they're, they're filled with light. They're filled with the grace of God. And 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 in that moment, it's a turning point. They turn and they face God, okay? And sees themselves as God sees them. But that, but they want nothing more from that point on than to do the work of God, you know. So, what do you think about what I said there? Is that possibly what an illumination of conscience is? I have no doubt. In your regards, and the way you describe your extraordinary experience, Father, yes, and the turn of events prove that fact. You are today in utter collaboration. You are doing what very, very few good priests do. You're working in collaboration with the gentleman of the likes of Doug. You're propagating the word of God at the best, with the best of your ability. It, you'd have to be blind or of bad faith not to see the print of God on your person, Father. You've gone, exa you've gone through exactly that. It's been your star of Bethlehem. You follow it through, and you're doing an extraordinary amount of work with, with Doug. 
this illumination of conscience that is to come will be, I believe, different for everyone, but yours is quite evident. When it happens, according to Conchita Gonzalez and Father Michel, it will last about a shorter period of time or so it will appear. It will last about 15 minutes. And as you very well described, Father, I every human did. being... Pardon? I think mine did. Yeah. It's like, go, oh, you know? And it was... It, <laughs> My eyes were open, you know, and I went, whoa, and and then everything changed. So, yeah. Everyone, even people that will be agnostic or atheist, Muslim, Jews, or people of all every denomination, according to the revelations that the Virgin Mary gave the children of Garabandal and Father Rodrigue, will know that there is such a thing as the notion of God. There is a God and there will be a Holy Trinity. There is a Holy Trinity. And that Christ, Jesus Christ, is his son. And that Jesus Christ founded his church on Peter. And apostolic, as you know, means from Peter all the way through every pope till Francis. That's what apostolic means. And everybody will be aware of that particular truth. For the truth is only but one. And every human being, no matter where their origin or their creed is all about, will finally, and with utter honesty, see exactly all the wrongs that they've done in their lives without justifying again the unjustifiable. They will know all the good they have, fell for, they have, they have failed to perform. They will so see all their faults, and they will see as well uh, that if they were to die at that very moment, I don't know if you had that experience, Father, but according to Conchita Gonzalez, everyone will know where, if they were to die at that very spot, at that very moment, if they would go to either heaven, purgatory, mm -hmm. or hell. Yeah. And on one instance, even Conchita Gonzalez said that the Virgin Mary, with an ever so sad voice, said that there will be an, a sheer minority, a very small amount of people who will be so shocked of finding the truth, but they will not survive. They will have heart attacks and they will die on the spot. There will be ever so few, but there will be some. Mm -hmm. And those who will uh, survive this experience, the immense majority of the people, once they come out of this new pa universal Pentecost or warning, will finally convert, will finally rush to see priests. A Catholic priest will make uh, non-stopping lines and will beg, will implore to be heard in confession and mm -hmm. will return to God for a brief period of time. No. Uh, and then there will be some other events. At that moment, we are told the devil will be enchained for about 40 days. 40 is, a, as you know, Father, is a very symbolic uh, number of days. No? Mm -hmm. Jonas, the temptation of Christ in the, in the desert, 40 days. Mm -hmm. After 40 days, the devil will be released. It will not mean that man will not be free to choose between good and evil. It will mean simply that the devil will be prohibited from using his minions or all his devices to lead man to his perdition for 40 days. After that, he will attack again. And according to um, some of the revelations that particularly Father Michel was told, there will be an alliance between the scientific commu world community and the geopolitical community that will state and will show and prove by A plus B that there's been at that time when the uh, this warning took place, furious solar storms that will have not only damaged satellites around the world, but will have affected the brain waves and the brave sequences of thoughts of men and would have created a mass hysteria, mass um, uh, illuminations, or uh, make them believe that their experience was true when in fact it was nothing else but an illusion. Hmm. A great part of those who would have converted would believe in such a thing and will decide to go back to their mediocrities of yesteryears. While those whose faith remain firm will maintain their path and will continue their path towards God in, within the tradition, traditional Catholic faith and rituals. Will we be able to leave our keys in the car? <laughs> That's a very good question, isn't it? Yeah, I, I want those days back. Yeah. But while we're recording, there's a geomagnetic storm right now. What's happening, yes, and I'm reading a, real lightly on it, but uh, 
the the uh, sun is in a phase where it's doing it's all it's exploding and i guess this is going to go on till 2030 so and with this is like a g4 so it's pretty intense and it can knock out the grid and it can do all kinds of stuff but uh but it 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 makes me wonder is this kind of stuff imminent i don't know that you just talked about because look what's Father going Michel on Rodrigue told me it is imminent i yeah. will tell you another thing i don't know if i told you on the last show um at the end of last year at christmas after I spoke with my wife my father doug i decided to take my family one last time to universal my children are still quite young i have a boy who <laughs> with a baby face uh is 15 years old but very innocent doesn't like vulgarities he's pre- and he is he adores christ he prays the blessed sacrament he's an altar boy and mm-hmm. a daughter who just turned 17 so they're still very innocent at heart and beautiful in at heart as well. I took them and my wife to Universal in, in Orlando, where we spent the New Year's Eve. Father Michel, I told Father Michel Rodrigue, and I told him, look, Father, I'm doing this because based on what I wrote, re- the book Revelations, based on my conversations with you and on the revelations to Marie-Julie Jani and the children of Garabandal and so many other places, I do believe that I'm not certain, rather, that I will be able to take the children to a normal vacation again. Hmm. Father Michel Rodrigue told me, Je vous comprends, Xavier. Vous avez raison. I understand you, Xavier. You are right. And then he told me, the uh, warning, the illumination of conscience, as so many people call it, is imminent. Hmm. He told me this in December. Then he told me, look, I'd like to see your family can we organize a Zoom conference call? Uh, I told him, well, yes, but we are the hotel. He said, no, I'd just like to see them and give them a blessing. I was surprised. Father Michel does not uh, usually uh, volunteer those sort of things, but he wanted, and I was very touched. So on that particular day, on New Year's, on uh, the 1st of January, I woke up my two monkeys in, who were in their bed I, with the head, with the foot. Come on, monkeys, get up. It's time to comb your hair. Get ready. Father, my, Father Michel wants to give you a blessing. So they all were prepared, their teeth were brushed, everything was ready. Father Michel gave them a blessing and told them, Xavier, you did the right thing. No? He didn't say that uh, illumination of conscience or the events will take place. He said last year, last summer, that the tribulations would begin in October of last year. Goodness gracious, did it, did it not? Didn't we see the war develop into something horrific in mm-hmm. uh, between Ukraine and Russia and the development, the expansion of the war in the Middle East? which feeds every party's, every belligerent's interest there, this is the beginning. And I do believe that indeed with what we are witnessing with the church, the civil war that uh, you agreed with me, Father, and uh, yes. that is taking place is getting worse. Yeah. It's getting worse. Yeah. I think, uh, and that is what all the visionaries uh, that I wrote about in my book always say, that we must keep, it is absolutely imperative, a very cold head. We must be fully aware as well that uh, um, every emotion that comes in us that inspires us anguish, concern, fear, is not inspired by God. The purpose of the devil, and that I assure you, he doesn't want anyone to know this. The purpose of the devil is this. The implosion of the Roman Catholic Church, the departure of as many faithful from a church founded by Christ as possible, the accusation, the condemnation, the calumniation and defamation of all the priests and men of the cloth, beginning with Rome, finishing by good priests like and bishops like Bishop Strickland. I know what we've heard also from um, the mission say Texas now. This is, to me, a declaration of war. I do not say that I agree or disagree. I understand the emotion. I understand the frustration. I am not certain whether this comes from God or not. I do not know yet. If it does come from God, and I'm not saying it is, we have no choice but to obey. If it does not come from God, if it, if there is some distortion due to human factor, no? It seems to me that we must remain very focused and very much like Peter when he was walking on on the waters in the midst of a storm 
we must continue forward, walking on the waters, keeping our attention on Christ. If we do, we will not sink. It was only when, Christ, when Peter started to realize where he was and look about his whereabouts that he began to sink. I believe we are to do the same thing. Keep our eyes on Christ calmly with a cold head and place ourselves at the feet of the cross. I am certain and I have no authority and I'll finish with this. I have no authority to say what I'm about to say. But my faith dictates to me that if all those place blindly and unconditionally their faith in Christ, after listening to these messages through the Blessed Virgin Mary by men of good conscience like Father uh, Richard Hellman and men of good will like Doug and John Henry Weston and so many others, I am absolutely certain, I bet my life, that God will come to your rescue. But in peace, cold head, and maintaining the faith in our church and remaining on board, not leaving the Catholic Church, for that is the purpose of the enemy. Nope. You know, that Xavier, that's something, and you know, you and I were talking about this on the phone earlier, and you made that point very clear to me on the phone. I'm glad you said it with the, the zeal and the passion that you just did, that the confusion is abounding. It is most likely going to get harder and get worse in many ways. We're going to see more breakdown in different areas, probably of the world. Right now, Haiti, as we record this, is is literally in some ways and figuratively on fire with wars, uh, you know, gang wars and such going on. Um, you know, I, I believe Germany, France also, as the U.S., have been evacuating people, our own citizens, out of there because things are just continuing to, to erode uh, with violence there. I, it's not going to be isolated there. The borders, both the Canadian border and the southern border, are both seeing a rise of, of you know, obviously we know for, for many years now, of illegals coming across in ways that are threatening. Okay, we've seen the reports of, you know, from federal agencies of the concern. All these worldly things happening, and they're most likely going to continue to get worse. It's within the church too, though. And I know there is this idea, this truth that as the church goes, so goes the world. The prophecies that are approved, the ones that you've written about in your book, Revelations, and again, I'll put the picture up here on the screen, and we want to encourage people to check the link, go out and get this book. It's amazing detail uh, that you've studied in here. But can you reference a little bit about what has happened in the church that these have been these have been um, uh, echoed through through years from different church approved prophecies and mystics, and where do you think this goes in the church? Obviously, you know only so much can you speak of regarding what has been um, come to light through through these different apparitions. But what what have we heard as far back as La Salette to Akita? you know, about the seriousness of what's happening in the church and where do you think this goes from here? Well, I will tell you the big lines and if you like, I can read you some passages of these approved apparition sites. Okay. The big lines are these. And please, what I'm about to say is of the utmost gravity. Uh, I will not apologize for it because it does not come from me. It's an echo of the messages that have been recognized by the Roman Catholic Church as being worthy of belief. So, what are we to expect? According to Maxima Giraud and Melanie Calva from La Salette, approved apparition site, Rome will fall. Rome will lose the faith and will temporarily become the seat of the Antichrist. Quote, unquote. According to Marie-Julie Jani, the Roman Catholic Church will temporarily like in La Salette uh, stated, will temporarily uh, fall on its knees and a false church will come from what will appear to be the ashes of the Catholic Church. But the Catholic Church will not die, will not fall, and will not be overtaken by the fires of hell. But there will be a false a doctrine that will come forth from the Catholic Church and which will be abominable uh, in the eyes of God. God will intervene when the sacrament of the altar will be finally attacked and replaced by a false consecration, by a false liturgy, which will not make the consecration of the Holy Host valid. At that time, the Holy Eucharist will be celebrated according 
to those prophecies by approved apparition sites in secret, like in the times of the catacombs. And there will be multitudes of false excommunications that will fall through. They will be no valid, not valid, very much like that of Bishop Cochon on St. Joan of Arc. And I remind you what Joan of Arc stated to Bishop Cochon and to his, her judges. Be very careful of how you judge me, for you place yourself in great danger. Those apparition sites, I cannot stress it enough, have been formally declared as being worthy of belief by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. Fatima, the third secret of Fatima, the second half. We've all heard the vision, the first half of the third secret, on June of the year 2000, by presented forth principally by His Eminence Cardinal Bertone. Now, I'll tell you formally, and I will tell you uh, what two testimonies I have from two other cardinals that will support what I'm about to say. But the statement by Cardinal Bertone wasn't true. That was not all about the third secret of Fatima. And I'm going to give you my evidence right now. But before I do also, I would like to bring to your attention the message of October 13th, 1973, Done or brought forth by the Blessed Virgin Mary to Sister Agnes Sasagawa in Japan, which was on the 56th anniversary of the last apparition of a Lady of Fatima and of the apparition of the miracle of the sun. To go back to our, the third secret of Fatima, the Blessed Virgin Mary, very much like with the first and the second secret, brought forth a vision to the children, immediately accompanied with an explanation. The third secret of Fatima was not an exception to that rule. And I have the message here, which was brought forth by His Eminence Cardinal Ottaviani to the German newspaper Neus Europa, and by the testimony of Cardinal Ratzinger to Bishop Ito about, in fact, the last message brought forth by the Virgin of Akita to Sister Agnes Asagawa on October 13th, 1973, which in the words of the own Cardinal Ratzinger, Prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith at the time, was nothing more but the echo of the third secret of Fatima. I have the, the message of Akita, I'll read it to you if you wish. It's chilling. And it yes. is somewhat uh, confirming the third secret of Fatima, as I've uh, revealed it from Cardinal Taviani. Shall I read you? Shall I begin with yes. the message of Akita? Yes, please. Yes. And so this is the the message brought forth by Sister Sasagawa on October 13th, 1973. Let me put my Mr. Magoo glasses. I'm getting up there in age, you know. <laughs> so, here we go. The message goes as such. My dear daughter, listen well to what I have to say to you. You will inform your superior thereof. As I previously told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as one that has never been seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity. The good as well as the bad, sparing neither priest nor faithful. The survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. The only weapons which will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left by my son. Each day, recite the prayer of the Rosary. With the Rosary, pray for the Pope, the bishops and priests. The work of the devil will infiltrate even into the, uh, in the Church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars will be sacked. The church will fall of those 
will, well, I beg your pardon, the church will be full of those who accept compromises and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. We mentioned earlier the trap that God is placing before us, didn't we? The devil will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. The thought of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sadness. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will be no longer pardon for them. With courage, speak to your superior. He will know how to encourage each one of you to pray and to accomplish works of reparation. The message here is very clear. According to the Lady of Akita, the Church will manage to infiltrate the Catholic Church. And this we see today. I have countless um, testimonies of friends of Father Laurentin, of my own family in Rome, who claim that the lobbies of uh, LGBTQ uh, is omnipresent in the corridors of the Vatican. No, uh, they have in allowed even the Freemasonry as well. We have openly declared bishops who are um, who declare themselves members of this lodge or this lodge of Freemasonry. There was, a, and I'm sure you of all people, Father, um, are aware of this. Uh, the passed away Cardinal Martini, Archbishop of Milan and Cardinal of Rome, was an openly declared Freemason in the Catholic Church and was a defender for uh, ideas and conceptions such as abortion, which are totally unacceptable and contrary, contradictory to the doctrine of the faith. Mm. The Catholic Church has a cancer within it, in particularly in Rome, which is the infiltration of the woke ideology, of the LGBT ideology, and of Freemasonry, which literally, and no pun intended, is the great architect of a particular scheme to have the Catholic Church implode within itself so as to spring forth a new false church. Mm. And that is what we are living today. Mm. Xavier, can you count, comment on this? Because it's amazing that you did that quote from Our Lady of Kitty, because I have it up on my screen, because I wanted to draw a line out of there. You mentioned earlier how... Um, you know, there's division in the church right now. I, is that the word you used? But uh, but there's division in the church like maybe we've never seen before. And mm -hmm. I was drawn, right when you said that, to the one line that you just read, the priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Mm -hmm. I think you could whittle it all down to that. And what do I mean by that? I said earlier that I think the two things that Satan hates the most are truth and transcendence and those who venerate the blessed mother are those who believe strongly that our poor faithful who are being lied to and manipulated um and and disconnected from the life of god need to have the truth clear uh clearly spoken shouted from the rooftops like i said like that parent that's shouting at that child running into busy traffic right no 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 you can't do that they need truth. The devil hates that. And what does he do? He incites his useful idiots. You know, those who are disconnected from God, those he can easily use. And what's happening to is in our historic moment, you said cardinal against cardinal, bishop against bishop. Well, there's bishops far too many. There's cardinals far too many that are doing the bidding of the radical atheists. Mm -hmm who take umbrance, who take issue with truth clearly spoken out in the open. And that's where a lot of the cancellation, the other way the cancellation is coming is treat, priests who truly want to bring souls, predisposed souls to have that illumination of conscience, to have that aha moment, that, that moment of awe and wonder before the presence of God. In other words, priests who focus on transcendence, when they offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass, they are being scorned and opposed by their confreres. And, and what, what is, is in every single situation, 
of those. And, and here's where I want to say earlier, too. Thank you for the beautiful compliments you gave me. But as I was listening to it, I said, um, Xavier, I just want to be a dad. I'm called father, but I want to be a dad and a, and a good dad. Uh, uh, and we need more of those these days are ones that keep the kids in line, okay? That keep them on the right path. And uh, however they can do that, and sometimes, like that parent shouting at the kid running out to traffic, they got to get a little tough. Like the Bishop Stricklands of the world, right? That, that <laughs> yes. no, you can't do that. But, but uh, I believe, uh, Xavier, that we're living in a moment where not only in the culture do we have weak parents, but in our church, we have weak dads, weak fathers, because they're letting the kids be easily manipulated by the world, and they're saying next to nothing, and they take umbrage of issue with any of those whatever word you want to throw at it, traditional, you know, that's like you're a deplorable if you're a traditional. And all that means is somebody who wants to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass as if that's really God on the altar. Can you speak to that? You, could, you couldn't have said it better. I am not, of course, an ideal father, but I adore my, I love my kids. And um, I will share with you in a family anecdote, if I may. My little boy, when he was maybe nine years old, uh, since they were very little, he and my daughter, I take them every first Saturday of every month to the Catholic Church, to church, for confession. We have a church here called the Immaculate Conception, and the priests there are splendid, very much like you, Father. And my little boy I, and, and my daughter, I always tell them at the end, don't forget, you know, you, I place myself at their height, on one knee, so that they... We see each other eye to eye, no, on the same level. And I tell them, and I told them, do not forget, whenever you go and see a priest, at the end of when you confess all your sins, of everything you've done naughty, tell him that you ask God forgiveness for everything else you've forgotten to mention. No? So they do, and sometimes you could hear the priest across the confessional laughing. So I took afterwards my boys to the chapel where there is perpetual adoration, and their father and Doug, as long as I'm able to open my eyes, this memory will never leave me. I saw my little boy kneel in front of the Blessed Sacrament, exposed behind a transparent crystal box, and he was saying, with his tiny pink hands like this, he said, I will, in English, I will never doubt, I will never doubt mm -hmm. that you're there, that you're there through the Sacrament of the Eucharist. Oh. I looked at him, and I thought to myself, my goodness, this is extraordinary. My tactic with my children was a lot of affection. Um, putting all misplaced pride on the side, giving my boy kisses on the cheeks, hugging him tight, the same with my daughter, being close to them and telling them at their height what is our faith all about. Of course, sometimes they dragged from school in the years after that, after that mediocrity, vulgarities, a lot of vulgarities from school, which is normal. But immediately we talk. And to be a father means to sacrifice your time that even when you're exhausted and get yourself at the level of your children and talk to them about it, mm -hmm. always with affection and with understanding. You know? Trying to teach them to like to pray the rosary. Or to this day, they pray with me, but it's, the crowd, it's, it's a battle sometimes, especially mm -hmm. when the competition are video games with their friends. But... Um, the children have a tremendous uh, gift. They are able to discern just by the tone of a voice or by the look of a person whether truth or an exaggeration or a lie comes forth. Mm -hmm. So it's a vocation, like being a priest, to be a father, dad. No? I'm trying to be a, a, a dad before being a father. Yep. But there are times when you have yep. to be a father before yep. being a dad yep. as well. So mm -hmm. you're quite right, Father. Savior, yeah. thank you. You're you're an outstanding dad. And I just got to say this before we end here, Doug. I've been watching you for years. You're the best dad I've ever met in my life. You're just unbelievable. <laughs> thank you. And uh, we could go on and on about that, but uh, thank you both for being great dads. And and I try to be a great dad too, you know. So, but I think dad, and I use that in the in, in the term of a dad is about love, and and love sometimes has to be tough. 
you know, in order to keep that kid out of busy traffic, I've been using that analogy, but, yeah. but you know what I mean? To keep them from <laughs> heading into a life. We've got so much mental disorder in the world right now because we've had weak dads that have not kept the kid straight and narrow mm -hmm. and, and uh, knowing clearly what is God's will versus what are the way, uh, way of the world. So Zave, I think there's a great place for us to end. Uh, let's end with a prayer mm -hmm. in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy amen. spirit. Amen. Amen. And let's, let's pray for a supernatural revival in the land. Come Holy spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. May almighty God bless you. The father, the son and the Holy spirit. Amen. 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 Awesome. Xavier. Xavier, Thank Xavier, you so Doug. much Xavier, for being with us again. Thank you very much, father. Thank you, Doug. It's been great to be here.